Uh, inshallah ta'ala, our first speaker is going to be Norman, uh, Ustad Norman. And you know, it's, this is the first time in my life I think I'm introducing him. Because uh, we're always sitting together on stage trolling each other, uh, sending text messages to each other while we're uh, speaking. So if you ever see him crack a random smile while he's speaking, it's because I texted him something funny. And if you ever see me crack a random smile, it's because he texted me something not so funny. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, Ustad uh, Norman, he's, he's one, of my, one of my best friends. And I'm not just saying that. You know, a lot of times you kind of have to say that. Close friend, best friend. And I've only met a guy two or three times. But he's one of my best friends, alhamdulillah. We've known each other for... Over, over 10 years of the job, I mean, and I'm very, very grateful that he took time out of his very busy schedule to come and join us today. Even though uh, we are close, he's very, very, very busy, and he actually just left his uh, Bayna campus to come to join us today, so I really appreciate him. Uh, he has no idea how much I appreciate him being a part of this, and he recognized immediately the importance of this class, alhamdulillah. No hesitation. You know, usually you have to nag him a little bit to get him to do something, but MashaAllah, no hesitation for this class. So I ask Allah to reward him and bless him for his time and bless his campus and his project and everything that he does and all of his da'wah and his family. Allah, I mean, with that, I'll ask him to come up, inshaAllah. And in this passage, Allah wants us to pay attention 
and reflect on some of his miraculous signs, his ayat. The, the purpose of ayat, just as a recap really quickly, ayat are of many kinds, and which I'm going to continue to call them ayat even though I mean miraculous signs, right? I'm going to use the term ayat, I prefer it. Ayat are, the, the purpose of them is to bring you closer to Allah. That's their, the purpose of ayat is to guide. That is the purpose. And so Allah divides ayat into many. There are ayat inside of ourselves. There are ayat in the skies. There are ayat in all of Allah's creation. And then there are ayat of revelation. Revelation itself, every piece of revelation in the Quran is an ayat. All of that is also an ayat. And the purpose of it is it guides you. Now, what's the logical relationship between a sign and guidance? Very quickly. So I have to pause this person. Oops. Oh, no, no. Okay. So what was I talking about? Ayat. Ayat. Okay. Make it very simple so your children and the audience can understand without a problem. When you see a sign on the road, the purpose of a sign is the sign is not your destination. The sign points to a destination. The sign is facilitating your journey. It is not the conclusion of your journey. Isn't that true? But you're grateful for a sign because without the sign you wouldn't know which exit to take or which direction to go in. You wouldn't know where you are. So the purpose of signs, literally in our daily lives, is to guide. Okay, in, in the physical sense, the ayat or alamat, these are the purpose of, this, of them is to guide us to a destination. And the legacy of the human being is to reach his ultimate destination, which is Allah, the meeting with Allah. And so his ayat, the purpose of them is to guide us through the journey of life and to be able to eventually reach Him. Now, having said that, there are some ayat in this passage. Allah Azza wa says, I'm, I'm, I'm picking here and I'll go um, from وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ And among His miraculous signs is that He created you from dirt. So the first of these ayat in this particular passage is reminding us where we come from is putting us in our place. And when you call someone dirt, or when you think of yourself as dirt, then you're basically thinking of yourself as worthless. You're thinking of yourself as something that should be cleaned off, something that's not pure. In other words, the idea of us being from dirt is already putting us in a place of humility. And as we will soon see, racism is directly related to a lack of humility. If one is not capable of being humble, one is not capable of being able to remove racist ideas or supremacist ideas from themselves. Because obviously when you think, or anybody thinks of one race as superior than another, or one nation better than another, then obviously they think of themselves as higher. Which is rooted in arrogance itself. So Allah says they're created from dirt. Then all of a sudden you are basha, you are people, and this is also an interesting word, basha, because it comes from bisha. It's translated as people or human beings, but actually the word basha comes from bisha, which means skin, which is cool, because Allah is now alluding to skin. And you are people that have skin running around. And one of the reasons the Arab linguists argue that human being is called basha from bisha is unlike other animals, they're covered in fur. Right, so there's the skin color doesn't show. We don't know what the skin color of a goat is necessarily when we see it, because it's covered in its fur, you know. But human beings aren't mostly covered in fur. So, <laughs> so you know, we know what our skin colors are. So Allah alludes to our skin as part of our humanity in the ayah. So, you're spread all over the place. Then even the reflecting on the word spread all over the place. Suggest that human beings are going to be in different corners of the world. They're going to be all over the place. But no matter where they are, high and low, Europe or Asia, America or Africa, it doesn't matter. They should all remember that they came from dirt. And that they, all, they should all remember that they all share this skin whose origin is the same patch of earth. It's the same mud from which they came. Now, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُلُوا إِلَيْهَا Then um, out of his miraculous signs, is that He created you, or for you, spouses, from your own selves. Now Allah is referring to the relationship between the male and the female. And this is another interesting thing. When we're talking about nations, ethnicities, you know, different communities living in harmony with each other, you can't talk about harmony at a social scale if you don't establish harmony inside a household. The first harmony is between the man and the woman. 
And part of, you know, arrogance, the first manifestation of arrogance is the conflict between men and women, as a matter of fact. So if you can remember that you were created for each other, so you can find peace and tranquility in each other, ilayha, wa ja'ala baynakum mawaddatan wa rahmah, and he put extreme love and loving courtesy between you, he installed it among you. Then, then he says again, in fi thalika la ayatin li qawmin yatafakkaroon. In all of that, there are certainly many miraculous signs for people that choose to reflect. Now I told you before, what's the purpose of a sign? To guide, to guide, to, rem to remain humble. Remaining humble, remembering that we came from dirt, was going to give us guidance. Being good to our spouse, having peaceful relations with our spouse, is going to lead to our guidance. All of these, and reflecting on that is going to give us guidance. But the next one, this is really the reason I picked this passage. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And among his miraculous signs is the creation of the skies and the earth. Now before I go on in the rest of this incredible ayah, the skies and the earth, does that include a few or countless creations? That's countless creations. And are they monolithic? Are they all the same kind of creation? Or is there a diverse kind of creation in the skies and the earth? It's incredibly diverse. It's incredibly diverse. And actually the beauty of this earth, let's not even think about the skies, because that's way too big for us to think about. We can barely even think about the first sky. Let's for, for a moment think about the earth. You know, and we can, we living in Dallas, Texas can appreciate this. We, we have a real appreciation for nature in Dallas because we don't have any around us. <laughs> right, so if we go, when you go to a city with mountains, when you go to a city with ocean, when you go to a city with trees, you know, <laughs> You will notice it immediately. It'll stick out and go, wow, it's so green. Wow, that's really beautiful. Look at those snow-covered mountains. You know, look at that scene. Now Allah Azawajal made this earth diverse. He made it different kinds of terrain. And part of the beauty of the earth is that it is different kinds of terrain. As a matter of fact, you'll find people that live in one kind of place, with one kind of terrain, for vacation, and for really enjoying the beauty of the earth, they will always go to a place that is of a different kind of terrain. If somebody lives at a beach in Hawaii, their vacation is not going to be a beach in California. They already enjoy the beach, they're probably going to head to the mountains or something. They'll go somewhere else, you see. Human beings appreciate beauty through diversity, through contrast, you know. So Allah says, reflect on the creation of the skies and the earth, and then, this is the part that I really wanted to highlight, he says, وَاخْتِلَافِ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ And among these miraculous signs is the disagreement and the differences and the contrast of your tongues. You people speak different languages. And not just, an alsina is different from lughat. Lisan, tongue, is different from language. There's a subtle difference between them. So you can have the same language, and within the same language, people have a different tongue. So you can have a city and it, the way people speak in the suburb is different from the way people speak downtown. They, they have a different lisan. The people that are in a particular kind of business or in a particular kind of profession have a certain tongue. And people in a different line of work have a different kind of tongue. Young people have a different kind of tongue and old people have a different kind of tongue. It's different. You know? And then of course, people of different races have different kinds of tongues. And I'm, I'm not just talking about across languages, I'm saying even within the same language. We live in the United States, and in the United States, if you travel across the country and pay attention to how people speak, you'll notice that there are, it's not one English. It's actually pretty remarkably different. It's allegedly the same language, but really very, very different. I came to Texas from New York. I mean, for a while I didn't think it was an English-speaking state. <laughs> you know. Then I realized we don't speak English in New York. <laughs> but, you know, the point is, these differences are something for you to reflect on. Now, before I go any further, because the, the, it gets juicier and more related to our subject matter. But before I get to that, these diversities, everybody can appreciate a mountain and find beauty in it and you know, appreciate the power of our Creator when they look at a beautiful mountain or they look at the gorgeous ocean and the sun's rays beaming through the ocean. But who looks at somebody with an Indian accent? Who listens to somebody with a little bit of a Swahili kind of on their tongue? Who listens to somebody with a Chinese accent and says, 
I, I feel the power of God when I hear this person's dialect as they speak to me in their acts. It's not a spiritual experience. As a matter of fact, the first thing that comes in our minds most of the time is, oh, that guy talks funny. <laughs> you know, it sounds weird. What is Allah doing in this ayah? He is rearranging the way we think. He's changing the way we think. People having an accent, people speaking differently, even though it's funny at times and it's pretty hilarious sometimes. At the end of the day, what is it? It's a sign of Allah. It's actually Allah molding this person's tongue a certain way. This is what Allah Himself did. This is Allah's craft, Allah's craft inside the mouth of every human being. I come from a place in the world called Pakistan, and in Pakistan we have people of different ethnicities. Officially, we're all supposed to speak Urdu, but people who speak Urdu in Karachi are different from people who speak Urdu in Lahore, and they of course make fun of each other for how they speak. You know, Pathans from the northern part of the country, the way when they speak Urdu, everybody makes fun of the way they speak. It's a common joke. You know. So even within ethnicities, or even within one country, you will find people making fun of the way each other speaks. Now, let's go back. If the ayah's purpose, what was the purpose of an ayah? What did I tell you? Okay, if the purpose of an ayah is to guide you, then aren't you grateful for an ayah? And what is worse than somebody who makes fun of the ayah? Who disrespects ayah of Allah? Allah just made everybody's language an ayah. Allah just made everybody's accent. Oof, that's hard one. An ayah. That just became an ayah. SubhanAllah. You know there were many different dialects among the Arabs. Not all the Arabs spoke the same exact kind of Arabic. And that's even true today. And with all of its diversities, all of them are still ayah. As much as I'm allergic to Hamiya, it's still an ayah. It is. People are speaking it. It is something that Allah has put on their tongues. Now, you would think, by, by the way, language is the first uh, uh, barrier. And this is uh, incredible sociological information. The way to connect with people is through common language. The way to break bridges, or build bridges, rather, not break them, build bridges is by common language. And so you'll find yourself having an easier time. If you just move to high school in the United States and you don't speak any English, you're going to have a hard time making friends. But the moment you start speaking a little bit of English and you can communicate and you can make friends, then you know what? There, there's going to be easier, it's going to be easier and easier to communicate. You find, for example, people complain, the city I come from, New York City, people complain about racism. And there are ethnic massages. So there's a Bangladeshi masjid, there's a Senegalese masjid, there's a Turkish masjid, there's an Indonesian masjid, there's a, an Arab masjid. And all these masjids have khutbas in their own local languages. But as a matter of fact, I wouldn't consider that a problem of racism. I really wouldn't. They're only going to these massages because a lot of these people, they don't speak English well yet. And they have a need to connect with people, so they go to people that speak the same language. It's not even a function of racism. It's just a function of people want to connect with each other. And the easiest way people can connect is what? Is language. I, before I studied the Arabic language, I'll tell you something flat honest. I used to think that Arabs are racist. All Arabs are racist. They just, if you don't speak Arabic, they're nothing. And I had personal experiences where I was dealt with in a very condescending way, and I had that opinion as a, you know, as a young college student. When I learned the Arabic language, and I spoke to just a couple of Arabs, just spoke to them in Arabic, I realized that they are a completely different people if you speak to them in their language. They, all of a sudden, all the assumptions I had disappeared. Because they are a completely different person when you speak to them in their language. It's, it's weird, but it's true. And that's true across the board, across many, many ethnicities. You'll find them becoming very comfortable when you break the barriers of language. Now, so Allah mentions, one of Allah's miraculous signs is the differences in our tongues. In our accents, in our dialects, in the way we speak, in the way we carry our tongues, in, the, in our languages too. Okay. But He doesn't stop there. And He says, Wa alwanikum. Of his miraculous signs is also the differences in your colors. He went right at it. Now he's just being explicit. He explicitly says, part of what will guide you is the appreciation that all of you as human beings don't share one color. You have a lot of different colors and some very contrasting colors. 
And all of those different colors of human beings, just like you go into a field of flowers and you see many different flowers and you appreciate the creative beauty of Allah's creation and it brings you closer to Allah when you see different people of different color skins and you see them all, you know, you don't say, oh, that's a nice color, yeah, that one, you know. Actually, no, you appreciate the creative power of Allah. And not appreciating any one of them is a lack of appreciation and gratitude for a sign of Allah, for an ayah of Allah. The, human, the Muslim, if, if we are nothing, if we don't have reverence for ayat, if we don't have respect and regard for ayat, and Allah made the color of human skin an ayat, an ayat. And as a matter of fact, He didn't just make the color of human skin an ayat, He said, right? This is the, the difference between your, the colors of your skin, or your, your languages, and your tongues, and your colors. Meaning, there are going to be differences. And there will be, there are going to be observable differences. My child, when he's very young, sees a guy wearing a white suit, and he thinks he's a white guy, no matter what color of his skin. But he's not going to be like that by the time he's twenty or thirty. He's going to see. It's going to be different. It's going to be obvious that he's different. He's different from other people of other skins. It's going to be obvious to him. But when it becomes obvious, instead of that becoming a reason for him to distance himself from people, if I raise him as a Muslim correctly, he will see that as an ayah of Allah. He will not see that as a means of his, his supremacy or somebody else's supremacy over him. That won't be there, you know. And so at the end of this, as I, as I conclude this particular passage, in In that, certainly there are some miraculous signs and some pretty powerful lessons for people who know. For people who know. Now we're learning something also that's really cool. It's, it, I think it's just incredible. Basically, if you fail to appreciate different races, then you don't know, which means you're ignorant. The Qur'an's commentary on racism, early on, is that it's a product of a lack of knowledge, it's a product of ignorance. And if we are living in a society that offers an education in engineering, in medicine, in the sciences, in the human sciences, sociology, psychology, we're offering kids high school education, and at the end of that education, you are still racist, then you don't know anything, you're still ignorant. You can have a degree, but you're still ignorant. Because according to the ayah, people can, the only people who can appreciate this is people who know. People, our definition of education becomes different. Is it true that we live in a world today that people are acquiring all kinds of higher education and yet they can't shed racism from themselves? Is that true? SubhanAllah. We, we, from the Islamic perspective, we don't call that an education. That is not an education. At the most, I'll call it skilled labor training. That's all that is. I mean, you just, I mean, if you went to school for accounting, then okay, you can get a job as an accountant. That's pretty much what you learn. You learn some kind of craft. But you didn't learn to become a refined human being. And that's real education is not just about a craft. And craft is important. But above and beyond that, it is what makes you and me a refined human being. That's what revelation is for. That's what these ayahs are. Okay, so that was a little bit of insight from the, uh, the Makkah Quran. Now we turn to the Madani Quran. In the time that I have, I have about 20 minutes left, I think? As long as you want. Okay, so I'm going to go. Uh, I don't think I'll take time. Okay. So, Surah Al Hujurat. Surah Al Hujurat is basically the Quran's curriculum on how to live together. Easy. If you want to get along with each other and live as a har you know, harmonious community, Take in the lessons of Surah Al-Hujurat and you'll be fine. It's a short surah but it's extremely comprehensive in the lessons that it covers for how to get along with each other as a community. And of course it begins with the constitution of Islam itself. If you're going to be harmonious, then you have to observe, your, 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 you all have to have the same code. You have to abide by the same ethics and law and morality and that will come from Allah and His Messenger. So, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا مَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ لَهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالْتَقُوا اللَّهِ Have reverence for Allah, have taqwa of Allah, have a taqwa for, you know, and, and don't get ahead of Allah and His Messenger don't put your opinions ahead of theirs, of, of, ahead of the revelation. That's where it begins. But what I want to highlight here is يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا What does يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا mean? Anyone know? Oh, you who believe, those of you who believe, those of you who claim to believe. Okay, that's the first ayah. Second ayah, Ya ayyuhu ladina amanu. Same address. Then third, uh, you go further down and in the sixth ayah, Ya ayyuhu ladina amanu and ja'atul qasit. So who's being addressed in the surah? You keep hearing Ya ayyuhu ladina amanu. The believing, the Muslims. 
the Muslims of Medina are being addressed over and over and over again. Okay. Then, in the Mu'minuna Ikhwah, believers are nothing but brothers. We heard those ayat, and I'll come back to them in a second. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu la yasqaqobun al-qawin. Those of you who believe, don't make fun of one, one group of another. Continuously, who's being addressed? Those of you who believe. Those of you who believe. Those of you. Then, ya ayyuhal ladina amanu ijtanibu kathiran min al-qawin. Those of you who believe, stay away as much as you can, and stay away from all, all, you know, most kinds of suspicion. And then, out of nowhere, ya ayyuhal nas. People. Not ya ayyuhal ladina amanu but ya ayyuhal nas. Now when, when Allah addresses people, is that one kind of people? Is that one race, one religion, one ethnicity, one group? No. That ayah is for everyone. That ayah is for everyone. Now, what we are learning in this surah is remarkable. And I can't go through all of the lessons of the surah, but I'll highlight what serves our purpose for today. And that is that the Muslims themselves need some kind of training. Listen to this part carefully. The Muslims themselves need some kind of training, they need an orientation on certain things about how to live harmoniously with each other. And if they do this training right, then they have to take that training to who? All of humanity. Because the Quran was addressing the believing community. But when he says, Ya ayyuhal nas, it's not limited to them. Even though they're the ones receiving the ayat, they're the ones discussing them. As soon as the Muslim hears, Ya ayyuhal nas, the Muslim realizes, this is something that only I don't need to learn. Who needs to learn this? Everyone needs to learn this. And who's going to spread it to everyone? I am. But I won't be able to until I have the proper training. The ayat of Ya ayyuhal ladina amu were training for the Muslim community. And if they can be trained themselves properly, then they are ready to take a message to all of humanity. And this will be this is one of the universal messages of Islam. This is one of the, you know, what does Islam want to share with the world? This is one of the Ya Yuhan Nasayat are the ones you want to share with the world. That's what you want to share with the world. So now let's talk about one, some aspects of this training that we're supposed to uh, pay attention to. Some of them will be brief, some of them will be more detailed. Ya Yuhan if a corrupt news comes to you, a corrupt source comes to you with some news, some corrupt guy comes to you with some news, then clarify it. Don't just listen to something and believe it. Don't rush to judgment about current events. That's just among ourselves, even. That's not even outside you, just among ourselves. Don't just hear something and believe it. Number one. Let's move forward. Yeah, you want to be now, and I'm going to where, where the Sheikh recited. Believers are nothing but brothers. Make peace between your brothers. And this ayah is actually preceding the ayah about Muslims fighting each other. When two groups of believers are fighting each other, make peace between them. I gave a khutbah about this a couple of weeks ago, and I remember talking about, you know, in this particular ayah, Allah has mentioned. First of all, he doesn't expect Muslims to fight with each other. Because if he did, it would be إِذَا طَائِفَتَانِ It's in طَائِفَتَانِ Which is actually, it shouldn't happen. It's Allah's way of saying it shouldn't happen. But it can. And it might. And as a matter of fact, in our reality, it does. Muslims fight with each other. You have to learn to resolve your fights. You have to learn to end the arguments. And if two groups are fighting, the rest of the Muslims have to intervene and do everything they can to end the fight. That's what the ayat are about. And that's not just something we're doing because we love each other. We're doing that above and beyond us loving each other. We're doing that because it's a command of Allah. We have to do it. We have to end our arguments. And then he says, we're nothing but brothers. That's how we identify ourselves. So when somebody walks in, I don't care what color skin they are, what country they come from, whether I speak the same language as them or not. They walked into a masjid, they're my brother. That's my brother. I don't see anything but my brotherhood with them. As my teacher used to say, there are people who have bonds with each other because of family, right? And even Allah acknowledges the bond of family. The people of the, that are tied by the womb are close to each other as far as Allah's book is concerned. But above and beyond that, when we share la ilaha illallah, then our bond together is thicker than blood. So how about we're proof of that? They were willing to fight with family to protect the one they share the shahada with. 
The Shahada took over everything else. It became the elite, the source, the oath of allegiance to each other. That's what binds us together. And if our brotherhood is weak, maybe our La ilaha illallah isn't that strong. Because if our Shahada was strong enough, it's enough to make new brothers with each other. Now, moving along quickly. One group of you shouldn't make fun of another group. You shouldn't, and Sukhriya uh, in Arabic is to be condescending. Making fun, you know, joking around with someone is okay. Joking around with someone with friends, with kids, all of that, that's fine. But when you start becoming offensive, and when you start talking down about a group, you know, and then you just you justify it to your I'm just saying, just kidding. But they don't think that. They actually find it offensive. Then you have to you have to cut that out. You have to cut that out. And then Allah, you know, particularly also mentioned, you as a whole don't do it. Well, that is how it is done. Women, watch out! Don't do it. He told women not to do it also, especially, you know. As if to say the way men make fun of each other is different and the way women make fun of each other is different. So you watch out for the way you do things. You know. But that, again, that's not the topic. This is all training of how to live harmoniously with each other. And then, you know, when after Bizu and Fusa come, don't call each other names. Don't give each other, you know, nick, you know bad nicknames. You know, don't blame, blame each other, don't judge each other, things like that. And then, don't use foul language, sense fusuk ba'da iman. Foul language itself is not something that you should do. Then stay away from making assumptions about people. Don't rush to judgment about people. We started with, if corrupt news comes to you, don't take it. Clarify it. But now we're evolving to the point where if somebody, if you see someone, before they even open their mouth, you pass judgment about what they're all about. You've sized them up. Don't do that. Don't make assumptions about people. We do this in the Muslim community, not just in the, in just generally but in regards to race, but we even do this in regards to any kind of appearance. If a person is dressed a certain way, whether or not they have a beard, whether or not a woman has a hijab, etc., etc., we size them up. <coughs> you guys owe me a paper because I just saved your lives. <laughs> anyway, so you know, you, we size people up about where they stand in their religion. Whether or not they're even Muslim, don't make assumptions about them. Yeah, and by the way, ijtanibu kathiran, we don't find this language in the Quran anywhere. Like ijtanibu kathiran. We find ijtinab, stay away from something. But we don't find kathiran with it. And this is important. This one, this one I have to highlight. Ijtinab comes from jam, which means the side. And ijtinab means to go out of your way to get away from something that is right by your side. Which means, assumptions are something that are always going to be there. You're always, our, our trigger response for us is going to be, we're, going to, we're prone to making assumptions about people. And the ayah says, go out of your way to fight that tendency. So it's not just something, oh, I don't make assumptions about people. Uh, okay, you're cleansed from that problem. It doesn't work that way. You have to constantly reevaluate whether or not you're rushing to judgment and making assumptions about people. That's inside the Ishtadibu Kathiran. Kathiran could be hard here, Kathiran could be qualitative or quantitative, to put it in non-technical terms. Qualitatively, it means as much as you can stay away from making assumptions. And in the other, mean, in the other sense, it means for, in the most cases, you shouldn't make assumptions. So then the question arises, if I shouldn't make assumptions in most cases, when should I make assumptions? And the, the response to that is, you should make assumptions when you give benefit of the doubt. When you see a guy and a girl walking together in the mall, there we go. These people. No, you know what? Make it make an assumption for the better and say they're probably better. They're probably better than brother and sister. Benefit of the doubt is a good kind of assumption. That you should. Any assumption you make about oh, I, I, here we go. This is this is how this, this person. I know what they have to say before they even open their mouth. Based on the color of their skin. Based on their their look on the outside. That's the kind of assumption you need to get away from. You really need to get away from it. You need to work on yourself in deep, uh, deep programming that out of your system. It's like a virus inside you. So he says, in the battle of the ethem, some kinds of assumptions lead to sin. Now, which kinds? The ones that are, you know, about the negative side of another person, right? Beyond that, don't spy on each other. Don't don't talk back against each other behind each other's back. Those ayat are all preparation for the Muslim to deal with the bigger problem. 
And Allah knew that the problem of humanity and racism in humanity is going to be a major, major problem. Racism isn't just about somebody not getting a job. Racism isn't just about somebody not getting equal customer service at a store or getting preferential treatment on an airplane. Racism can cause wars. Racism can get millions of people killed. Racism can lead to the blood spilling on the earth. Is that a reality today? Yeah. So we know that that's a much, much deeper, much bigger problem. So Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nas. Humanity, listen up. Inna halaqnaakum min dhakarin wa unfa. There's no doubt about it. We're the ones who created you from a male and a female. Now here's the, the beautiful part. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُرُوبًا And we made you into shuroob. I won't translate shuroob yet. It's a beautiful word. It's got commonly gets translated, we made, we, we made you into nations and tribes. Have you heard that translation before? Mm -hmm. We made you into nations and tribes, right? We'll dig a little deeper into this word. It's important to understand. But before we get into that word, جَعَلْنَا We made you this way. And جَعَل is used in Arabic when something was a certain way and it was transformed into something else. If you have wood, you can do ja'al of it and make it a table. Yeah, I took it and made it into a table. So the, the word ja'al includes a transformation. Something was a certain way and it was made into something else. Allah is telling us, had He wanted, we would have been one race. In the word ja'al, He's telling us, He didn't have to make us into different races. He could have just made all of us the same skin tone, all of us the same language, all of us the same culture, he could have done that. But he chose not to. He's the one who made us. By the way, he made us from how many families? How many parents? One parent. If you come from one parent, isn't it logical that you'll all be one race? Wouldn't that make sense that you're all one race? So the expected conclusion was, if you come from one father and one mother, you should all be the same race. But he says, no. After making you from a male and a female, miraculously, I'm the one who made you different. I did, I intervened and didn't let you stay one race. You know? And Allah says, had he wanted, he could have made you one ummat, ummat al wakila. Would you mean one nation? He didn't. So what did he make us into? Allah says he made us into shu'ub. Shu'ub is the plural of the word sha'ab. I love this word. Allah didn't say unas and peoples. <coughs> he didn't say aqwam and nations. He said shu'ub, it's a very precise word of the Arabic language. And the word sha'ab. <coughs> it's, it's one of those words in Arabic, it's hard to understand in English this concept, but I'll explain as best I can. It's one of the words in Arabic that mean it's opposite at the same time. It's called Lughatul Aqdal. It's the word, it means something, and it means it's opposite at the same time. I'll give you an example of that, it's kind of some idea you get of what, what I mean. The word Al Hay or Al Hayya in Arabic means life. Life. But it's also used for a poisonous snake. Now when you think of a poisonous snake, what comes to mind? Life or death? Death. Something that takes life is a hayya. But if you're standing in the desert, all the sand is still and you see something slither, you're going to think hey, something alive is there. right? So it's a word that conjures up the image of life and death at the same time. It brings about the thoughts of itself and its opposite. That's from Lughat al Abda, the language of opposites they call it. It's a rhetorical thing in classical Arabic. Shurub is one of those words. It makes you think of a number of things and their opposite. So what are those things? al jamr wa tafriq Things coming together and things being apart at the same time. I'll give you a lughat al but not lughat al Lego and afda Piece of Legos, you, you put some Lego pieces together and you made something. And it's one thing, but if you look carefully, is it one thing or many things? It's many things. Like if you go to Legoland or something and see a giant, like, you know, Empire State Building. It looks like one building, but when you get close, it's all these legal, little Lego pieces, isn't it? So the word Sha'ab means people overall, but actually very individual, very different. And the word Sha'ab already means that I cannot say about the Nigerians, I cannot say about the Somalis, I cannot say about the Bangladeshis, I cannot say about the Malaysians, oh, they're all the same. No, there are people, but they're all individually very different. They have some commonalities, but then they have some things that are very different about them. That's inside the word shah. Then the other side of it, which is really cool too, al-islah wal ifsad. Shahab actually means to put, fix something and make something corrupt, to break something. Something that has good qualities and something that has bad qualities. Now Allah is saying every nation has good qualities 
And every nation has what? Bad qualities. Every human being has good qualities and every human being has bad qualities. And by extension, every culture can have some very good aspects to it and some very bad aspects to it. It can happen. So now no culture is perfect because we're all sure. No one culture has it all right. No one culture is supreme in every single way. It's impossible now. What this does, if, if we understand the logic of the ayah, number one, we can't judge any nation because they're not all the same. We can't stereotype people anymore because of the use of the word shiru. Number two, we cannot consider ourselves a perfect people because there is no such thing. When you come as people, there are some things that are great about you and there are some things that are terrible about you. We made you into nations, shuruban, nations that are diverse even within, and nations that have good and bad qualities. Also, inside one word, how comprehensive is that? How different is that from reading, we made you into nations and tribes? It's a world of a difference. It changes perspective entirely. Now, watch this. You have one nation that's really good at one thing, but not so good at another. You have another nation that's the exact opposite. They're good at what this is bad at, this one's bad at, and they're bad at what this one's good at. What would be a great solution to this problem of two nations? If they learn from each other, then they can learn best practices from each other, can't they? And then all nations can improve. So Allah made us, by making us shuru, literally, He made us necessarily dependent on each other. So in the word shuru, by Allah making a shuru, it is as though Allah created a situation where you cannot have isolationism. We just want our people. We don't want to deal with any other people. We want everybody to be all the people that look like us and talk like us and you know act like us. We should stay together and we should stay away from all other nations. No, because the word shuru is there, you want to get to know other people. Because they have something to offer you, just like you have something to offer them. Now, the, because the previous ayat already told us not to make assumptions about people and not to find faults in others, even if you realize the fault in another people, your, your focus is not on their faults, your focus is on their good. What, what can you benefit from and what can you benefit them with? That's, that becomes the attitude. So he says, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا Then he says, قَبَائِلْ So beautiful. Then the word قَبَائِلْ Qabail is the plural of the word qabila which means tribe. And the word Qabila comes from the word Qubul, which means back. What is a head? Qabail actually means, if you go Qabil, Qabla Dalik, or Qabla Dalik, or Qabla Dalik, they have an ancestry. We made you people of different ancestries, which means different heritages. Now if you go far back enough, where does our, all of our ancestry lead? He already told us. If you go far back enough in every Qabila, what's Qabul Kulli Hada? <laughs> It's Adam alayhi salam. You go back to that. But Allah mentions here, He made you qaba'il. From qaba'il, you get there are traditions that come from before. There's folklore, there's architectural history, there's language, you know, there's song. There are different aspects of every culture that are made, that, that Allah has crafted. So He made you this way. And every, every tribe, every culture in this sense, has its own unique identity. But why did He do that? Why did He make us all so different? Why couldn't he just make us one? Humanity would have been one. Can you imagine? Allah could have made that decision way back then, an executive decision from Allah, and we wouldn't have a discussion about racism. It wouldn't be there. He says, here's why I did this. Li ta'arafu. Li ta'arafu. Which is roughly translated so you get to know one another. You get to know one another. Al-Urf in Arabic also means cultural norms. Every society, every tribe, every nation has certain norms. So you can understand each other's norms is within the meaning. They're not going to be like your own norms. They're going to be different. The way they eat is going to be different. The way they sleep is going to be different. The way they talk is going to be different. The way their family structure is is going to be different. And you're going to appreciate the difference in them. You're going to get to know it. They say, رَجُلُ الْعَارِفْ اَيْ صَبُورُ The son of Arab argues. Someone who knows in Arabic, there's alim, someone who knows. But if you call someone Arif, then you're actually saying they're extremely patient. Because they understand things from a different perspective. So they're not as shocked by something or offended by something. Allah says, I made you into different nations and tribes, so you can go and explore other people, learn about them. And when you learn about them, what at first seemed to you as so offensive and so backwards, 
Now you appreciate it from within, so you, you're patient towards it. You have an appreciation for it. And so we're learning that we cannot have roof. We cannot develop patience with each other and appreciation for each other until we interact with each other. Until we explore the diversity of, of different cultures. We don't want to have one monolithic society with one culture. By the way, the nation that wanted everybody to be like them, or said that we are number one, nobody can be like us. We have the ideal, you know, we have the ideal way of living. The, the phrase for that in the Quran is al-Mutla, your ideal lifestyle, the exemplary lifestyle, that was Firaun. So when human beings lose their humanity, they start thinking they're perfect in every way. And their nation is perfect. That's a sign that you're no longer really a human anymore. You've lost it. It's to these, these, this phrase on its own is the death of racism. It's the death of racism. This is why I gave you, you know, uh, your diversity. Now as the, as the ayah concludes, and I conclude, إِنَّا أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمُ The most noble among you. What did the ayah begin with? You remember? Was it يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا or يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ? Who remembers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it wasn't يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا This was يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ People! People are being addressed, not Muslims. Muslims are not being addressed. People are being addressed. And Allah says, the most noble among you are the ones that have the most taqwa. The most God conscious. Now, I would expect Allah would say the most noble among the Muslims are the ones that have the most taqwa. Because you assume and I assume that taqwa belongs to who? Muslims. Allah said, all of humanity, listen up. The most noble among you are the ones that have the most taqwa. Allah did not restrict taqwa to Muslims. Because there could be non-Muslims that have taqwa and Allah will guide them. And you don't know that because taqwa is on the inside. So there could be a righteous person living in your neighborhood and he's not a Muslim, but he's noble in the sight of Allah. Even non-Muslims. He could be noble, who knows Allah will guide him. Maybe he has taqwa already inside him, he just doesn't have hidayah yet. You know? He doesn't even have guidance yet. Inna akramakum inda Allahi atbaqum. In, and how are you supposed to know if they have taqwa or not? Ya Allah, how am I going to know if somebody has more taqwa? Because Allah says the most noble of, the, of us are the ones who have the most taqwa. So maybe there should be some taqwa sticker that we give people. So we can give them scores and points and we can tell who we should respect and who we shouldn't respect. That's guy, that guy's got a lot of taqwa, so I should respect him. Muslims do fall into this category all the time. We say, I, I get emails, brother, I, I met a, you know, I have a friend, he's got a lot of taqwa. Or I met the sheikh, he had a lot of taqwa. Or, you know, this girl says, I, I met a guy on Facebook, he's got a lot of taqwa. You know, he quotes a lot of ayat. Uh, okay, where do we begin with this? You and I give each other benefit of the doubt. And no one knows the level of taqwa of anyone else. No one knows. And to make that clear, nobody can make that clearer than Allah Himself. So He says, in Allah, Ali al Khabir. No doubt Allah in fact is the one that know, is all-knowing and has full account. In other words, Allah said, by the way, you should have the most respect for the people of most taqwa, but I won't tell you who they are. What does that leave you with? You should have the highest respect for everyone because you don't want to take a chance of dishonoring someone who Allah has honored. It makes you an honorable people. It makes you an honoring people, a respecting people. You know, This is what we're supposed to be. This, I mean, if we learn to carry ourselves this way, we just stick out. The world, the, the, the comedy culture around us, the high school culture is extremely racist, it's getting even more racist nowadays. You know, the, the entertainment culture is racism. They, they talk about political correctness, and the more they talk about it, the more its artificial nature becomes apparent to everybody. It's artificial, it's so surface, it's so surface, you know. We are so far from fitrah that it's, it's mind-boggling. And one of, the, one of the worst things that's happened to us, that we've lost the original decency of Allah gave us, is manifest in racism. It's manifest in other ways too, and I'm leaving you with this one, because I'm still, my head is spinning from this one, because I was on a flight just now recently, uh, just yesterday I got off a flight, and there was a very chatty lady next to me. I said, she said, you going home? I said, yep. She said, me too. I said, okay, that's cool. But she wouldn't stop, she just kept going. So, you married? Yes, I'm married. Kids? Yes, I have six kids. So, when somebody asks, do you have kids? 
What's the courteous follow-up question from you? Well, what about you? Do you have children? No, I have a dog. And I am still, I still have a headache from her response. I didn't say, do you have a pet? <laughs> I didn't say. I didn't refer to. Who, what other creatures live in your household? I said, do you have children? And she said, no, I have a dog. I'm, I can't wrap my head around this. Because in her mind, why would you need children? if you have a dog. You see? And she talked to me about how ch children are such high maintenance. She talked to me about that. And I'm just, I didn't want to, you know, insult her or anything. And I'm like, you walk around picking up your dog's poo off the street. And children are high maintenance? But I, I didn't want to say that to her. But I wanted to highlight something. How far from Fitra we are. That people say, well, I really want the loving companionship of some, something to take care of. Which Allah put it us because Allah put a want of having what? Children. But I don't want to have children because they're high maintenance and you have to get them insurance. Dogs don't need insurance. You know? So, we're just going to go with fluffy. The two things are equated to that. It's just one of the indications. I brought this tangent up because one of the indications of how far from the natural order of things we have come. How these weird aberrations have become normal to us as a society. You know? And then racism certainly is a part of that. I pray that Allah Azza alleviates this ummah from its racism. I pray that we become a people that appreciate the diversity that Allah has gifted us with and makes us learn from each other's strengths and, you know, help each other overcome each other's weaknesses just like one Muslim brother is supposed to be to his other Muslim brother, we benefit from his good things, and we advise him and counsel him and help him with his weaknesses. That's what you are supposed to do for me, and I am supposed to do for you. That is what we're supposed to do at the level of nations and tribes, at the level of entire ethnicities and cultures. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make us one Ummah in the true sense of the word. Barakallahu wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum wa Thank you.